May? Question, you can raise your hand to the camera or you can chat. You can text the message to me through chat. Or you can unmute your mic and just start talking to us. That's the other way. Hi, Eric. Can you oh. hear me? Yes. Okay, this is Karen. I have a couple of questions, and I wanted to tell you a little bit about myself. This is my second time to listen here, but I actually have a lot of questions, but I'm going to address two of them tonight. I came from a background of the Church of Christ, which, okay. and, and that's when I lived in Texas. Now I live in Louisiana. I um, don't go there anymore, but I am uh, go to more of a full gospel church. Um, I have a question about a lot of things, but two things. Water baptism, first. My upbringing was that you had to be water baptized in order to receive salvation, and unless you were... You were not saved. Right. I understand the difference between that and what you described earlier, which is kind of more what I've been taught in the last three and a half to four years, that it was, it's the first, um, how did you call it, the first act of, um, it's the outward sign of what has already happened inwardly, basically. Mm -hmm. um, but I, my question is in Acts chapter 9, verse 18, um, it says, and immediately there fell from his eyes, and it had, as it had been scaled, and he received sight forthwith, and arose and was baptized. Yes. And that's Paul himself. Paul himself, so, yes. I don't reconcile that for me, that we're not, that that's not something we need to do today. Okay, so do you understand the basics of right division where... The dispensation of grace that we're currently in started in Acts 9. Are you familiar with that? I, I'm, I've just been introduced to this okay. by my Helen, who invited me on this call um, just a couple of weeks ago. So I've just kind of been introduced to it. Okay. Um, it would probably take me a little bit to answer that. Why don't we... Why don't you if we could just, can we save it till the end? And I'll answer your question at the end. I just don't want to, you know, that, that way. I'll answer it before we leave tonight, but then. Uh, he, he doesn't want to rush through it. Um, oh, that's since, fine. Because I'm still, I'm still oh, considered a newbie myself, um, Karen. Um, Eric introduced it to me, and I went to a Baptist church. So you're asking a great question. And I, I, he just doesn't want to rush through it um, because he wants to make sure you have all the verses that you need. Well, okay. well plus, plus I want to make sure that we get to uh, others' questions too because it may take a while to go through it. Um, now, what was your second question? My second question is, you said that not every promise is for us or to us today. And in uh, 2 Corinthians 1 verse 20... And, um, again, realize that I may be pulling this out of a context, but it's just what went through my mind. For all the promises of God in him are yes and amen unto the glory of God by us. So okay. that's all the promises are yes and amen. So I was just kind of confused. Oh, okay, basically, a short answer to your question about the promises of God. Um, Basically, God has promised different things to different people at different times. So, if God has promised things to you, then He will fulfill those promises. Um, so, that's what it's talking about. When all the promises of God in Him are yea and in Him amen unto the glory of God by us. Basically, the promises that are for us today, given to us today, are found in Paul's epistles, Romans through Philemon. When I answer the water baptism question, that might be a little easier to understand. Um, and so all those promises in there are for us, and God will fulfill those. There are other promises in God's Word that are not specifically to us. Let me just give you two quick examples, and they may seem a, a little crazy, but uh, hang with me. Let's look at Genesis 6 
and Genesis 15. We're going to look at Noah and Abram, just to illustrate this. So in Genesis 6, you've got man is evil, he's wicked. And verse 5, it says, God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Verse 7, the Lord said, I will destroy man who I have created from the face of the earth. Verse 8 says, Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. He tells, God tells Noah in verse 13, the end of all flesh has come before me. Verse 14, he says, make thee an ark of gopher wood. So basically the story is, God says, the world is evil, I'm going to destroy the world, but Noah, I'm going to save you, and the way I'm going to save you is you make an ark of gopher wood. So, the promise in Genesis 6 is, if I make an ark of gopher wood, I'm going to be saved from God destroying me. That was a promise to Noah, but that's not a promise to me. I don't build an ark in order to be saved from being destroyed. God has promised that he will destroy the earth at his second coming. He will do that. And he's given us a promise of salvation from that. But my promise isn't build an ark of gopher wood. It's trust in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection as atonement for my sin. So, I am going to be saved from the destruction of the earth, but I'm in a different time frame here. So, God had a different way to fulfill that promise than he does back in Genesis 6 than he does for me today. So, that's why the promise of building an ark of gopher wood in order to have be safe from the destruction of the earth is not a is a it's a promise of God it's in God's word but it's not to me specifically so that's not that's what I mean by saying there are promises of God in God's word that are not for us that are not you have to look at the context you look at, have to look at the audience the second one Genesis 15 uh, this will be a, a quick one as well in Genesis 15 God brings Abram forth uh, in verse 5, it says, He brought him forth abroad and said, Look now towards heaven and tell the stars if thou be able to number them. And he said unto him, So shall thy seed be. Verse 6 says, And he believed in the Lord, and he counted it to him for righteousness. So God makes a promise to Abram, If you believe that, this, that the stars, um, and your seed is going to be as numerous as the stars in heaven, then God says, I count that to you for righteousness. That's not a promise to me. If I look up in the stars and say, okay, I believe God that you are going to make my seed as numerous as the stars in heaven. That's biblical. That's a promise of God. But that's not how I get righteousness. <coughs> the way I get God's righteousness is trusting in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. So I have to look at the promises that God... I know these seem like crazy examples, but basically I have to look at promises that God has made to me. So I look at the context, I say, God didn't speak to me like he did with Noah. He didn't speak to me like he did with Abram. But he did speak to me uh, and Paul the way he did with Paul. And so I trust in the promise of God to give me eternal life through Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. And, and that's where the right division comes in as well. So hopefully that, did that make sense? Yes, it did. Thank oh, you. Okay. okay, and I'll get to your water baptism before we, before we go. Okay. Okay, was there any other questions? Okay. Kevin, do you have a question? Uh, yeah. We know that in Galatians he talks about, uh, uh, Paul talks about, you know, anathema. And I know we didn't touch on that much today, but, you know, we're sure getting a lot of Catholic overtones coming our way with so many of the different things we see in, in as far as religion goes around us. And I just can't reconcile it on my head that they're actually, they're actually saved. I can't get it because it, they're not believing. They're not believing upon Christ's death, burial, and resurrection in order to be saved. They think they've got to do good works in order to be saved. So how do you, how do you go about that one there? Uh, in terms of, you mean, how do you talk I mean, to Catholics, saved? or... 
Yeah, no, the Catholics actually, Catholics are probably some of the easiest people to take to this gospel than anyone else because they're so old, they're just so wiped out and tired from trying to keep <laughs> up with all the good works, yeah. and all, all the rituals. <laughs> I mean, they're just wiped out. And so I, I have found that many Catholics are very, very sincere in their desire to, they almost look at it as if though a, a huge weight has been lifted off of that. Not all, but there are there's a few that do. And I, I notice that they're a lot easier to talk to than, quote, like you come from my background, which we've laughed and talked about before, Pentecostal. Right. You know, you can't go talking to Pentecostals as easily as you can to a Catholic. They're hardcore, man, set in, set in stone, that's it. You know, they believe you can lose your salvation. And I know better than that. You know better than that. You mm -hmm. went to Calvary Chapel. I know exactly where you went. <laughs> so... Talking about legalism, yeah, yeah. Gee. Um, so I got to wonder about their salvation at the point, you know, if, you know, if they truly believe, believe in his death, burial, and resurrection without anything else. And I love the way Les Feldick used to say it, you know, through faith, you know, uh, um, my grace through faith plus nothing. <laughs> That's yeah. pretty much where you're at. Nothing else is involved. It's by grace through faith. If you don't go that route, how can you be saved? You can't. I think I, that, I just I've yeah. been trying to hope for both for those that are somewhat closer to you know that maybe are you know the Pentecostal view you know the church started Acts chapter two. Yeah, it it just goes back. It, so. it goes back to what we talked about tonight. It's the deception, deception of the heart. Yeah, I I've mentioned. I don't think you were listening when the time I mentioned it, but there went to a church, a Baptist church, and the. And the pastor preached a salvation message, but he said you had to confess your sins and make Jesus the Lord of your life. He has just a couple little things in there. And I tried to tell him afterward, you know, I really wish you to preach the clear gospel. I tried to tell him what the clear gospel is. And he says, but I did preach a clear gospel. And that's the, that's the problem you have with, like you say, with ones that are, when you get these denominations that are closer to the truth than others, then, you know, the Catholics, like you say, they're so beaten down with the works and everything, they can see the great freedom of grace. And that's how it was for me, too, coming from a... It wasn't just Pentecostal, but it was a holiness background before Calvary Chapel, and that was very legalistic. So you can see the freedom of that. But when you go to a church like a Baptist church, and they say they preach eternal security, but yet if you don't have works to demonstrate the true faith, then you're not uh -huh. really saved... So exactly. they're not really preaching eternal security, but they say they are. So then you go to them with the gospel of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, and they say, well, I already believe that. You know, but do they? And that's, well, you know, that's something that... That's, you, that's my question is, are they saved, though, if they really, truly believe in the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ? You know, if, uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 2. And if they got that down and they believe that, yeah, they're adding a lot of works in there, which is going to keep them from the fullness, you know, of complete, you know, walking in the Spirit, by the Spirit, the whole thing, because they're not, they're not trusting Him. They're trusting in themselves to carry these things through to prove Him for His favor or whatever. You know, they've got a whole host of excuses that come along with it. But right. if you don't get the answer to prayer, you know it's because your faith isn't strong enough. That's yeah. another good one, too. Yeah, I think, yeah, 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 I heard that growing up as well. We believed in divine healing. Yeah. Yeah, and it's just that they just end up being deceived. I think of uh, Matthew chapter 7. I think it's chapter 7. Yeah, Matthew chapter 7 and verse 21. Verse 21 through 23. There are these religious people that Jesus is talking about, and on that day of judgment, he says, you're not going to enter in. And yet they object. It says, in verse 21, Matthew 7, not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works? And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. A lot of the denominations... They say, you know, we're saying, thus saith the Lord. They prophesied in the name, and the Lord's name. Uh, cast out devils. Maybe they, you know, the, the, the Pentecostals and the physical healings and things that they do. 
and then uh, doing many wonderful works. Maybe the Baptists are in that with the works that they do to try to show that they had true saving faith. And um, If those are the things they trust in, the point is, if you trust exclusively in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection as atonement for your sin, you have eternal life. If you don't, then you don't. It's just cut and dry. And so it really is. I don't know, yeah. I don't know what their heart is. Jeremiah 17 10 says, I the Lord search the hearts and try the reins to see what is in the heart of man. True. They can tell me, oh, I trusted in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. But did they actually? I don't know. And it'll come down to that judgment day where we'll find out. But yeah, I think there are a lot of people, because it says, many will say to me in that day, I think there are a lot of people who are following a Christian religion, thinking that they are saved, but they've just been deceived. Because they never believed in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection right. alone right. as atonement for sin. Yeah, they, yeah. That's that's true. And, that, and you're right. And even at the judgment seat, in that the, they may have trusted in, in, in the gospel, but by adding all the extra works along the way, that will keep them from, you know, the levels of authority and position of responsibilities that the Lord can give them at the judgment seat when they, what we did with Christ. Yeah, it's, it's twofold. God's will is for all men to be saved and to come yeah. into the knowledge of the truth. So there are some people deceived, not believing the clear gospel, and then they don't even make it into heaven. And then there are others who right. have believed the clear gospel, but they've been deceived afterward, and then they lose the reward. They don't come into the knowledge of the truth. Right, yeah. right. That would be it there, wouldn't it? That's yeah, kind of what I'm hoping for for my family. <laughs> <laughs> some have already gone on. And I'm hoping that they're there just because of the fact that I knew that, you know, I knew, I know genuinely in their hearts they really loved the Lord and wanted that. And I know that growing up, I always believed in the death, throne, and resurrection of Christ Jesus. Never had a doubt in my mind about that. <clears throat> even myself, even a child on, I believed it so, so sincerely. Um, just it was all the other stuff that was so hard to get through because I couldn't keep up with it. I just couldn't do it. Yeah. Yeah, and the good thing is, the good thing is, you don't have to spend fifty years, and all those fifty years believe in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. You just have to believe it at one time. You know, right, right, right. You know, Second Timothy two, over in Second Timothy two, verse thirteen, Paul is talking to believers there. You know, Timothy, the church, and he basically the situation is, you believe the gospel. You've been saved, but then you decide, oh, that's just a bunch of hocus pocus. I'm going to live out in the world, or I'm going to do religious works, or do whatever. And this, and it says there, it's 2 Timothy 2.13, if we believe not. So we believe the gospel, but then we follow religion. We follow the legalism, or whatever it was. If we believe not, yet he abideth faithful, he cannot deny himself. That's right. Colossians 3 says, You're, ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ and God. So if I'm hid in Christ, if I go into, after I believe the gospel and I go into religion and I just work, 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 I decided not to believe, I believed in the law instead, but Christ abides faithful, he still has to give me eternal life because my life is hid with Christ and God. So to throw me into hell, Christ would have to go to hell too. And since he cannot yeah, deny yeah. himself eternal life, then he cannot deny me eternal life either. So that's the good right. thing, is if you have family, he grew up in a church, and um, they taught Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, but there are all these works as well. Yeah. As long as there is at least one point in time when they believe the, the true gospel, they're going to they're make it. They'll be in heaven. Because at that moment, they were placed into Christ, and right. Christ has to give them eternal life because he cannot deny yeah. himself eternal life. Christ isn't going to go to hell. And so they can't go to hell either if they are in Christ. Right, right. So, right. yeah, you let, can take... Let God be true and every man a liar. Yeah, it's, you can take comfort in that. Yeah. Yes, amen. Thanks, Eric. Uh -huh. Okay, anybody else? Does anyone else have a question? I, I noticed, Lisa, there are some things in chat. I don't know what's in there. Um, I can't, I'm not seeing the chat. Let me see. I don't know why I'm not seeing it. 
Oh, there's six things in chat. I'm, I'm so sorry, y'all. Um, thank you, Eric, for telling me that. Um, Nathan said, thanks, Eric. Gail said, thank you so much, Eric. Um, Kevin Rain said, gracias, bachacho. I guess I'm saying that right. Oh, my camera is blurry. I'll have to... I have to try to clean that for next time. I've had that um, problem before. <laughs> Scott, uh, Scott said, Christ is life eternal. Amen. Yeah. Beautiful. Thank you. Yeah, I'm glad uh, Scott's able to listen. He's over, in, uh, he's over in Vietnam listening. Oh, my goodness. So, glad he's able to join us. I have no idea what time it is there. <laughs> Okay, well, I guess if there's nothing else, then I'll answer Karen's question about the water baptism. And then, you know, if something else comes up uh, after that, we can address it then. Okay, um, so water baptism, I understand. I know the Church of Christ position. Uh, one good thing about the Church of Christ is they take a literal uh, translation of scriptures. And I think that's why they believe you have to have water baptism in order to be saved. Because that's what Acts 2.38 says. Basically, to give you, since you're not too familiar with right division, to give you a brief history of what water baptism is all about, is if you go over to Exodus 29, water baptism was established by God under the Mosaic Law as a ritual cleansing ceremony for the priests. And that's what you have here in, here in Exodus 29, uh, verse 1. It says, This is the thing that thou shalt do unto them to hallow them, to minister unto me in the priest's office. And it gives you a whole bunch of things that they are to do. Uh, one of the things they are to do is, in verse 4, Aaron and his sons, so Aaron was the first priest and then his sons would be priest after him. Aaron and his sons... Thou shalt bring unto the door the tabernacle of the congregation and shalt wash them with water. So in your Old Testament, the only time you have water baptism really is with the, and these are the Levitical priests. You had the 12 tribes of Israel, which if, if you were a church of Christ, you probably know your Bible really well, so you understand all that. You have the 12 tribes of Israel. The Levitical tribe was the one set aside by God to be the priests. And so then they were required to, as an ordination of the priest there to be washed with water. Um, so it was only for the, in the Old Testament, you only see water baptism among the Levitical tribes. If you were a believer in Israel and you were of a different tribe, you didn't get water baptized. And then when you get to Matthew chapter 3 and John the Baptist comes on the scene, he says he's preparing the way for the Lord and he's bab water baptizing everybody who believes. He says, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And he does the water baptism, not just the Levites, but for everybody who believes. The reason is you go over to Exodus 19. God started the nation of Israel initially with Abraham in Genesis chapter 12. He says, I will make of thee a great nation, and in thee shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. I will curse those who curse you. Bless those who bless you, and in, in thee shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. Um, so, he sets Israel aside to be his people. But before we read um, Exodus 19, look in Deuteronomy chapter 7. Deuteronomy chapter 7, talking to Israel there in verse 6. In Deuteronomy 7, verse 6, God tells Israel, For thou art a holy people unto the Lord thy God. The Lord thy God hath chosen thee to be a special people unto himself above all people that are upon the face of the earth. So when God created the nation of Israel with Abram in Genesis chapter 12, and then going forward, they actually become a nation when they come out of Egypt. Um, he says, I have set you above all the people of the earth. You are a holy people above the Gentiles. 
Well, the reason he did that, go back to Exodus 19. The reason he did that is when he made the Old Covenant. Because in Exodus 20, he had the Ten Commandments. So this is, Exodus 19 is when he is about to give the, the Mosaic Law to Israel. And he says to Israel there, starting in Exodus 19, verse 4, Exodus 19, 4, Ye have seen what I did unto the Egyptians, and how I bare you on eagles' wings, and brought you unto myself. Now therefore, if ye will obey my voice indeed, and keep my covenant, then ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all peoples. So there's the above all people, for all the earth is mine. So then what God is saying then, remember from Genesis 12, I will bless those who bless you, curse those who curse you, and these shall all the families of the earth be blessed. So God is saying, I'm setting you, Israel, above all people, and then Israel is going to go to the Gentiles and give them the gospel so that they may be saved. So he says in verse 6, that's what he says. He says, Ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. So God called Israel to be a special people unto God, much like he does with the body of Christ. The body of Christ, he says, You are my people, I give you eternal life, you are ambassadors for Christ. That's pretty much what he did with Israel. He says, you are my people, a holy nation, so you are going to be a kingdom of priests. So when we read in Exodus 29, when a priest is washed in water, the reason that John the Baptist starts washing everybody in water, all the believers, and has water baptism, when in the Old Testament you only found the Levites being water baptized, the reason all believers were being water baptized started in Matthew 3 is because it was part of that ordination ceremony to be a kingdom of priests. He said, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Meaning that if Israel had believed, then Jesus' second coming would have come shortly after uh, his death, burial, and resurrection. And he would have come and judged the all the things that happened in Revelation would have happened. He would have come judge the Antichrist and all those people following him. And then the remainder of the Gentiles who did not follow the Antichrist, Israel would go out as a kingdom of priests to the Gentiles for them to uh, hear the words of the Lord, to be saved. That's basically God's plan for Israel. He says, I'm going to reconcile all the earth back to myself, for all the earth is mine. And you, Israel, are going to be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation to do that. So water baptism in the Old Testament is only for the Levitical priests. Then when you get to Matthew, it is for all believers for, um, in, in Israel there because the kingdom is at hand. And they were about to, at Jesus' second coming, they would go out to the Gentiles as a kingdom of priests. And so priests had to be washed in water according to the Levitical law. So that's, where, that's why they were to have the water baptism. Now if you go over to Matthew 21, there is a problem in Israel. Uh, maybe it's not 21. 23, I'm sorry, Matthew 23. So Israel is supposed to be a kingdom of priests to reach the Gentiles with the gospel. But what happens, as you know the story, reading Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, is that Israel crucifies Jesus. The nation as a whole doesn't believe. And so, just before he goes to the cross, when I say just before, it's probably a couple days before, in Matthew 23, verse 37, Jesus says, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them which are sent unto thee, how often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings, and ye would not. Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. It's not God's house anymore. If you know your Old Testament, God left the temple in Ezekiel chapter 11, I believe it is. He's gone because of the apostasy of the nation. Jesus is in the temple there to be accepted as the Messiah at that time. That's a faith response to Jesus would have been to accept him as the Messiah there in the temple. Instead, they're asking him questions, trying to trick him, and they end up crucifying him. So Jesus says, your house is left unto you desolate. 
He says, verse 39, For I say unto you, You shall not see me henceforth, till you shall say, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Basically, he says, I've pronounced judgment upon you for your unbelief. He even says that in verse 33, Ye serpents, ye generation of vipers, how can ye escape the damnation of hell? You've been an unbelief throughout all these generations. God has sent his Messiah in the flesh. He's standing right before you in the temple, and you won't accept him as Messiah. So he says, that's it for you. Your house is left unto you desolate. However, that's the nation as a whole. There is still some people in Israel who believe God and his word. The 12 disciples. In Acts chapter 1, there are 120 gathered in the upper room. So there is a small group of believers in Israel. And remember what God told Abram in Genesis 18. God, Abram says, are you going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah if there are 50 righteous, 40 righteous? He gets them all the way down to 10. Are you going to destroy the Sodom and Gomorrah if there are just 10 righteous? And God says, I won't do it. If there are at least 10 righteous, I won't destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. Well, in Acts 1, there are 120, apparently, that are righteous. 120 people in the upper room. So God says, although you can't es not escape the damnation of hell because you're unbelievers, He says, I'm not destroying the nation at this time. So in Acts, if you go to Acts 2 now, and this is the verse that you're... Uh, Church of Christ usually uses to justify using water baptism. And if you think that the current dispensation started in Acts 2, um, you know, then you would go by this. In fact, you know, I, among all the denominations out there, I think the Church of Christ does the best job because at least, in terms of water baptism, because at least they are believing um, what God says right here. So in Acts 2... Peter explains what they've done. He says, This Jesus, whom you have, you have taken with wicked hands... Where am I? Um, uh, where is it that they took him with wicked hands? Uh, verse 23, Acts 2, 23. Him, being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, ye have taken, and by wicked hands have crucified and slain. So the nation as a whole is guilty of the blood of Christ. They cannot escape the judgment of hell because they have been in unbelief, and rather than accepting their Messiah, they crucified Him. But God has mercy, and there are some believers. So He says to them, at the end, verse 37, there's this group of people, when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart, and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? In other words, we're subject to God's judgment for using wicked hands for crucifying and slaying Jesus. What should we do? And Peter answers in verse 38, Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. So he says, You have an opportunity, even though Israel as a whole has rejected their Messiah, you have an opportunity to be saved. And so you can repent and be baptized. You have to be water baptized in order to be saved. That's a correct interpretation of that verse. Because they were required to be water baptized as to be a priest in Exodus 29. And since Exodus 19 says Israel is going to be a kingdom of priests to the Gentiles, that's why they had to be water baptized in order to be saved. And notice what he says in verse 40. And with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. If they're untoward, they're not toward God. Remember he says over in, in Matthew 23, he says, Ye generation of vipers, how can ye escape the damnation of hell? He says they are a generation of vipers. They are not toward God. They are untoward him. They have gone away. Jesus Christ has come. God has come to them in the flesh, to save them. And they turned their back on him, went away from him, spiritually speaking. So he says, you can be saved from this untoward generation, basically if you're water baptized. You repent and be water baptized, and that's how you are identified. You are not part of that nation that is going to be destroyed. The untoward generation, the generation of vipers that's going to hell. 
He says, you are part of the believing remnant who believe God and His Word, and you confirm that with the water baptism, since that's going to be required as a kingdom of priests to reach the Gentiles uh, in the millennial kingdom. That's the reason for water baptism. When we get to what ends up happening then, finally, when you get to Acts 9, um, well, when you get to Acts 7, they end up stoning Stephen. And at that time, if you look at Acts 7, verse 55, at the stoning of Stephen, it says, But he, that Stephen, Acts 7, 55, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God and said, Behold, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. Basically, the opportunity to save yourself from the untoward generation is now coming to a, a halt here because Israel as a whole has still rejected God and His Word so they're not going to be a kingdom of priests to reach the Gentiles now. There were 120 that believed uh, in Acts 1. There are, I believe it's 3,000 that were added to the church in Acts 2. Acts 2.41, there are 3,000 added. There's 2,000 added later on. There are more believers in Acts 6. The group is growing, but the nation as a whole has rejected God. And that is seen by Jesus standing on the right hand of God. Uh, we know that's important for a couple of reasons. Uh, one is that it's told to you twice, verse 55 and verse 56. Whenever God says something once, it's true, it's important. But if He says it more than once, it's very important. So He says it twice. Verse 57, we know that it's important because the Pharisees, it says, then they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and ran upon Him with one accord and cast him out of the city and stoned him. They end up stoning him to death. People will say what churchianity says is, oh, well, that was just Jesus standing to open up his arms to welcome Stephen to come in as the first martyr of the Christian faith. That's what churchianity teaches. But if that's the reason that he stood, if in other words, if there is no prophetic significance behind Jesus standing here, then they would not have cried out with a loud voice, stopped their ears, ran upon him with one accord, and cast him out of the city. The religious leaders knew there was something significant behind Jesus standing. And that is found if you go over to Isaiah chapter 3. Isaiah chapter 3 gives you a prophecy here in Isaiah 3 about when the Lord stands, what is He doing? It doesn't say the Lord is standing to welcome with open arms the Christian martyr. It says in Isaiah 3.13, The Lord standeth up to plead and standeth to judge the people. The Lord will enter into judgment with the ancients of His people and the princes thereof. For ye have eaten up the vineyard, the spoil of the poor is in your houses. He's saying Israel is an apostasy, and so when God stands up, He is going to stand to judge the people, and He's going to take the ancients of His people and the princes thereof, and He's going to judge them for their apostasy, for teaching false doctrine. So, when Stephen says in Acts 7 that he saw Jesus standing on the right hand of God, and then he says again in verse 56, the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God, the religious leaders who knew their Old Testament well knew that he was basically saying that God is judging Israel for their unbelief. And that's why they killed him. I mean, you know, if, if you just said the person, you know, if, if all it was was if they just thought that, oh, Jesus was just some religious leader, he was wrong, and uh, we, are, we the Pharisees are right, and you just said my religious leader stood on the right hand of God, well, that's not going to affect me. Who cares? But if you know that prophecy says the Lord standeth up to judge the people, and Stephen says he saw Jesus standing on the right hand of God, 
And then he says again, he saw the heavens open and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. That's telling the Pharisees two things. One, it's saying that Jesus is God and you crucified God. or They, they crucified the Son of Man. I, they didn't crucify God, but I mean, they crucified Jesus. Jesus is God. So that's the first thing it tells you. And it tells you that he's standing up to judge the people as Isaiah 3.13 says. And they know this is of God because this is Stephen speaking. We are told in verse 55, it says, he being full of the Holy Ghost. So it's God speaking through him. And then also if you look in Acts 6, verse 15. In Acts 6.15, when Stephen is given his testimony, which is he's standing before the council and he speaks throughout the Acts chapter 7, where he basically gives an indictment of Israel. It says in Acts 6.15, All that sat in the council, looking steadfastly on him, saw his face as, a, as it had been the face of an angel. It is basically like, I mean, Stephen is a man, but it's basically like they are looking at the angel of God, giving them an account of Israel's history, and how they have been in apostasy the entire time. It says in Acts 7.51, Ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised and hardened ears, ye do always resist the Holy Ghost as your fathers did, so do ye. It's basically like an angel of God has come to Israel and has judged them to be in apostasy, and then the Lord himself stands and judges the people saying, you're out, Israel. You're not my people anymore. I'm setting you aside. That's what happened here. And the Pharisees evidently understood that, at least to some extent, because they didn't just say, oh, Jesus standing on the right hand of God, the guy's crazy. No, when he said that, they, they cried out with a loud voice. They stopped their ears. They don't want to hear any more of this judgment of God. They've seen the face of an angel speaking to them. And so they say, we got to get rid of him, and they killed him. So that right there is where God sets aside the nation of Israel. And then he ends up calling the Apostle Paul and he starts the dispensation of grace, which is what we currently live in. And we don't really have time to go into it, but um, I believe that takes place in between the dispensation of grace that we currently live in uh, starts in Acts 9.23. And... At some, at some point in, in the future, we can go over that. Um, so, going back to your original question then, uh, Acts 9.18, what, what ends up happening there is you've got Ananias. Has Saul has seen, been on the road to Damascus. He's seen the light from heaven. He's been blinded. God sends Ananias to him. And the Lord told Basically, he says, uh, let's see, where are we? Um, so, God sends Ananias to Paul. Where am I? Let's see, Saul arose, he was blinded, and then he arose in verse 8, Acts 9, 8. Verse 9, he's there three days without sight, neither did eat or drink. Then verse 10, you've got Ananias. The Lord appears to him in a vision. And then verse 11, The Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the street which is called Straight, and inquire in the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus, for behold, he prayeth. And hath seen in a vision a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him that he might receive his sight. Ananias says, Wow, I shouldn't listen to him. He's a, he's a murderer. I don't want to have anything to do with him. And then he says, the Lord says in verse 15, Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me. So verse 17, Ananias went his way, entered into the house, putting his hands on him, said, Brother Saul, the Lord, even Jesus, that appeared unto thee in the way, as thou camest, hast sent me, that thou mightest receive thy sight and be filled with the Holy Ghost. And immediately there fell from his eyes as it had been scales, and he received sight forthwith, and arose and was baptized. And when he had received meat, he was strengthened. 
Then was Saul certain days with the disciples which were at Damascus. So basically, Ananias comes to Paul and he preaches the gospel to him. The gospel he preached was Acts 2.38. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. You say, how do you know that? Well, he says that the Lord came to him that thou mightest receive thy sight and be filled with the Holy Ghost. And then he doesn't, and then he has to be water baptized before he receives meat and was strengthened. I think that's a reference to him receiving the Holy Ghost there. But the reason we know that Ananias preached Acts 2.38 is because if you go over to Galatians 1, Paul was given the gospel to trust in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection as atonement for your sin. Water baptism wasn't involved because God set aside the nation of Israel. They were no longer his people. Jews and Gentiles were on the same level, playing field, basically. And so in Galatians chapter 1, verse 11, Paul says, But I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after man, for I neither received it of man neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. And that's what we talked about before in Galatians 2, 7, that the gospel that Paul preached was the gospel of the uncircumcision. That is, trust in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection as atonement for your sin. The gospel of the circumcision that was committed under Peter was repent and be baptized for the remission of sins. Water baptism required for Israel to be the kingdom of priests to go to the Gentiles. Since we're in the dispensation of grace now, water baptism isn't required for salvation because we are not set aside above uh, the Gentiles. We are, we are the body of Christ. We're ambassadors for Christ. But God is doing something greater, and I'll get to that in a moment. But anyway, the point is, the gospel that Paul preached he says in Galatians 1.11 that it was not after man. Verse 12, he says, He neither received it of man, neither was he taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. That means that the gospel that Paul preaches without water baptism could not have been preached to him by Ananias in Acts 9. Because he says he received it from revelation of Jesus Christ. He did not receive it from a man. So Ananias... And I believe they, again, we'd have to do this another time, but I believe that that gospel, the mystery gospel that Paul was given of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection as atonement for sins apart from water baptism was given between Acts 9, verses 22 and 23 in there. Uh, so, but the fact that Ananias preached the gospel to Paul and before that, means it could not have been that gospel of Galatians 1. So it had to have been the gospel of the circumcision that Peter preached, which was repent and be baptized. And so the reason that Paul was water baptized in Acts 9.18 was it was part of that Acts 2.38 gospel. In order for him to be saved, he had to have been water baptized according to Acts 2.38. Then there is a dispensational change that takes place between Acts 9, 22 and 23. And when that takes place, then water baptism passes off the scene. It's not used anymore. The reason for that is if you go to Colossians chapter 2. And I feel like I'm doing a poor job at this because I'm skipping over a whole lot of detail, but we'd be here all night if I went over all that. Um, Colossians 2, for us in the dispensation of grace, when we were saved, it says in verse 10, Ye are complete in Him, which is the head of all principality and power. So I'm complete in Christ. And what He does, and I'll get to the verses before that in a minute, is verse 13 it says, He's forgiven you all trespasses. Verse 14, he blotted out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us. Romans 6.14 says, You are not under the law, 
but under grace. So God, with the dispensational change, He no longer has us under the Mosaic law. He has us under grace. God has blotted out the head right of ordinances that was against us. The reason that God does that, verse 16, let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of a holy day or of the new moon or of the Sabbath days. Those are things that are under the Mosaic law. He says you don't have to remember the Sabbath day anymore. You don't have to respect a holy day or a new moon or have the proper... Uh, meat and drink of feast days or animal sacrifices, all those things. Why? Because verse 17 says, these things are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. When God starts the dispensation of grace with Paul in Acts 9 verse 23, then he says, I'm taking away the Mosaic law and those things because they were a shadow of things to come. The body is of Christ. It's here. Uh, look over in Hebrews chapter 9. I'll give you an idea. Actually, if you start Hebrews 10 and verse 4. Hebrews 10 verse 4 says, It is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sins. But yet, if you're under the Mosaic law, you had to have sacrifice bulls and goats. There were these animal sacrifices in order to cover sins. Well, why would God have you do that if it couldn't take away sins? Well, because He was trying to teach them something. Because they were walking in unbelief, they were walking by the flesh, God used symbolism in the flesh to show what He wanted to do spiritually with them. He says, there is a sacrifice of my Son that will need to take place in order for you to get eternal life. But since you don't understand that, I'm going to start with these animals so that you will see it in the flesh. And then later on, the ultimate sacrifice, the blood of Christ, will come. If you go back to Hebrews 9, 13... Hebrews 9.13 says, For if the blood of bulls and of goats and the ashes of a heifer, sprinkling the unclean, sanctifieth to the purifying of the flesh. Purifying of the flesh. In other words, all the things of the Levitical Mosaic law had to do with purifying the flesh. Verse 14 says, How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. God wasn't interested in a bunch of animal bloodshed because all it did was purify the flesh. Ultimately, he was interested in having the blood of Christ purify your conscience or purify your soul and give you eternal life so you could stop doing these dead works and serve the living God. So in Colossians 2.16, when it says, Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or respect of a holy day or of the new moon or of the Sabbath days, verse 17 says, Those are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. The reason water baptism is not for today is it's just a shadow. It purified the flesh. But water baptism wouldn't purify your soul in and of itself wouldn't purify your soul. The blood of Christ purifies your soul, therefore the water isn't needed anymore. And you can see that if you go back to Colossians 2.10, and I, I want to read those verses now that we skipped. In Colossians 2.10, it says, Ye are complete in Him, which is the head of all principality and power, in whom also ye are circumcised, with a circumcision made without hands. So if you're a believer, you have been circumcised. Physically, no. Spiritually, yes. It says, it is the circumcision made without hands. God isn't in... Now God told Israel, He started it with Abraham in Genesis 17. And He says, I have given you circumcision as a token or a sign of the covenant. That you must do this do they physical circumcision or else you're cut off as my people. 
But today, God doesn't say that. God doesn't say you must be physically circumcised or you're not saved. Be why? Because when I believe the gospel, I am placed into Christ. It says I am circumcised with the circumcision made without hands and putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Christ did something far better than physical circumcision. He cut off the link between my flesh and my soul. Before I was saved, all I did was sin. I did the lust of the flesh. My spirit was dead in trespasses and sins. All I did was sin. But when God saved me, He says, I have cut that link or I've circumcised the flesh. I've cut it off from your soul. Now, you could still listen to your flesh. But you don't have to. You can now listen to the Spirit of God speaking to your spirit and make decisions based upon that. And so, since the spiritual has come, the spiritual circumcision has come, the physical is no longer needed. Well, then you go to verse 12. Now, you notice verse 11 is not, there's not a period at the end of verse 11. It says in verse 11, "...in whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands." and putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, now verse 12 tells you how he did it. It says, You were buried with him in baptism, wherein also you are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God, who hath raised him from the dead. Since the circumcision is not physical anymore, it's spiritual. And verse 12 is an explanation of the circumcision of Christ, because verse 11 ends with a colon. What comes after the colon defines what was before it. So the definition of the circumcision of Christ was that you were buried with him in baptism, wherein also you are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God, who hath raised him from the dead. So since the circumcision is spiritual, the baptism is also spiritual. And, and so basically, water baptism is not really needed at all. Because God says, just a few verses later, He said, verse 16, Let no man therefore judge you in, and He gives that list of things, verse 17, which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. Water baptism purifies the flesh, and it was a shadow of things to come. When you believe the gospel today, you are you're placed into Christ, into His death, burial, and resurrection. And so when that happens, you have a spiritual circumcision and a spiritual baptism. And so you are clean spiritually, not just the flesh, but spiritually you are clean. That's why you can't lose your salvation, because you're placed into Christ and there's no way of getting out. And so God says the circumcision and the baptism of the Mosaic Law and the meat and the drink and the holy days, new moon, Sabbath days, those are a shadow of things to come. The body is here now. And since the body of Christ is here and you're complete in Christ, the water baptism isn't needed anymore. So basically in the dispensation of grace, uh, God doesn't recognize water baptism. That's basically a church ordinance. Um, and the reason Paul was baptized in, water baptized in Acts 9.18 is because that was before the dispensation of grace started, which is in between verse 22 and 23 of Acts 9. So, um, that was, I know that took a long time, but that's a, that was really a short explanation. Uh, did, did that make sense? It does make sense, and I, I thank you for taking that time to take me through that. Uh, I know I have uh, a lot to study with that, but um, a lot of mindsets that kind of ingrained there, um, so I, I have to kind of process it, but I thank you so much is what I can say to, to you for explaining that as well as you did. Oh, well, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. And I know that too. I grew up in a church that did not teach this. I learned right division when I was about 17 or 18. And coming out of that, it takes, uh, it, it takes a while. You know, you can see the verses, but then you see them in a different light. And it's hard then to just automatically say, okay, that's how it is, you know. It, it does take some time. So, yeah, um, you know, you say you have other questions. We can, you know, next week or the week after that, we can go through, 
you know, those as time goes on. So. Right. Um, yeah, and I want to say thank you for asking your question, Mrs. Lisa. I want to say thank you for asking those questions, and we really enjoyed hearing Eric's answers. Thank you, Karen. And um, I think Sandy uh, has a Sandy Allen had a question about that, Eric. If we still have time, um, okay. She said so. She said so. John the Baptist was baptizing the Jews to prepare them to become priests because at that time he didn't know that they, the Jews, would utterly deny Jesus as their king. And then she said, I meant so that they would become priests to the Gentiles. Is that correct? Yes. Um, again? Yeah, over what, Jesus, what John is doing... And I think it tells you in John 3. Yeah, I'm sorry, Matthew 3. Yeah, if you go to Matthew 3. And I hope I read that correctly, Miss Sandy. Yeah, Matthew 3. Yeah, Matthew 3. Yeah, Matthew 3. Yeah, Matthew 3. Yeah, basically, the, the dispensation that we're currently in was a mystery. Um, let me, I, I guess, the. Since you're in Matthew 3, let me go ahead and read that. Um, so John the Baptist, verse 1, In those days came John the Baptist, preaching in the wilderness of Judea, and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he that was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah. So Jesus is the one, or, I'm sorry, um, John the Baptist is the one that was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. So, Basically, John the Baptist was sent to fulfill prophecy of the one preparing the way for the Lord. The, God's plan for Israel was, if they believed, they were to accept Jesus as their Messiah by faith. And then they were to, if they did it by faith, they should have sacrificed him in the temple John said, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. And so they should have recognized the, Jesus as their Messiah and recognized Him as the ultimate Passover Lamb that would be sacrificed in the temple for their sin. And that, that's what they should have done. But they, by wicked hands, crucified and slain Him. They were in unbelief. They didn't say, Oh, Jesus is our Messiah, let's celebrate him as the sacrifice for our sins. They said, he's trying to overtake our religion. Let's destroy this guy. And so basically what John the Baptist was doing is he was trying to prepare the way for Israel to accept Jesus by faith as their Messiah. So he was preaching the gospel of the kingdom to repent ye. Repent means change your mind. You're on the path of unbelief. Get away from that path of unbelief. Believe God in his word. Then be water baptized as a part of the kingdom of priests. Then we'll accept Jesus as the Messiah, as the Lamb of God, which takes away our sins. And then Israel as a kingdom of priests can go to the Gentiles uh, with the gospel so that they may be saved. That, that was the plan for Israel. And John the Baptist didn't know that that wouldn't take place. Uh, if you go to Romans 16... If you go to Romans 16 and also look in Acts 3, we'll read the Romans 16 passage first. Romans 16, 25, Paul says, Now to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel, that's Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery which was kept secret since the world began, but now is made manifest. See, what Paul preached was a mystery which was kept secret, but now is made manifest. Now compare that to Acts chapter 3. In Acts chapter 3, Acts chapter 3, Verse 19, P. 
Peter said, and this is a different gospel, the gospel of the circumcision, he says, Repent ye therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord, and he shall send Jesus Christ, which before was preached unto you, whom the heaven must receive, until the times of restitution of all things, which God hath spoken, not will speak, but hath spoken, by the mouth of all his holy prophets, since the world began. What Peter preached in Acts 3 was the message, or what we would call the prophecy program, that had been spoken by the mouth of all of God's holy prophets since the world began. What Paul preached in Romans 16.25 is the revelation of the mystery which was kept secret since the world began. So when you were in Matthew 3 and John the Baptist, John the Baptist had no idea that we would have this dispensation of grace, mystery dispensation uh, today. He, all he knew was what would have been spoken by the mouth of all of God's holy prophets since the world began. So he knew that God had spoken, Israel is going to be a kingdom of priests to reconcile the earth back to God, and that a priest must be water baptized as part of the ordination of, to be a priest. And so God had him water baptize all believers who came to him to prepare them as a kingdom of priests to go to the Gentiles. Yes, so that's what... Um, that's what he was doing, yeah. Okay. Um, Eric, if it's okay, Miss Sandy had one more thing. Okay. He said, How old, how old are you? So if they had acknowledged Jesus, had the Jews accepted Christ as their king, they would have had to have made him a sacrifice in the temple? Question mark. So they would have killed him anyway? Question mark. Is that what you're saying? Question mark. Yes. Yeah, remember what we read in Hebrews 9, verse 14. Hebrews 9, 14 says, How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? If Israel had faith in what God had told them, they would recognize that the blood of bulls and of goats is not sufficient to take away their sins. Israel would recognize they had a sin problem, and so then they would have recognized their Messiah had to suffer. He had to die for their sins. And so, um, basically, he, they had to have a sacrifice. The difference is um, God's plan was for... as. Yeah, go over to John uh, chapter 1. John chapter 1, verse 29. John chapter 1, verse 29. John the Baptist prepared the way for Jesus for six months there. And then Jesus comes and says, The next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him and saith, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. When Jesus is first introduced to the nation of Israel by John, because John prepared the way for him, he's first introduced as the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. A Jew would have known what that meant, because every Passover, they had to take a lamb without spot and blem or blemish. They had these certain requirements. They took the lamb, they sacrificed him on an altar, and that would be a covering for their sin. So when John says, the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world, then they should have recognized that, okay, that means that he is the Passover lamb. And the difference between what they did and what they should have done is basically where their heart was. They were in unbelief. Peter says, ye have by wicked hands, you have taken and crucified and slain him. When the Pharisees brought Jesus up to trial before Pilate, and the people cried, they said, yes, crucify him. And the people of Israel said, his blood be upon us and our children.
Basically, they're saying we're taking full responsibility for killing our Messiah in unbelief. It's basically what they're doing. But if they had seen him when they came into the temple, if they had seen Jesus and says, Oh, you are, as John said, the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. And I know from what I read in Exodus 14 and 15, Leviticus 23, and those Passover references, I know that a lamb is sacrificed on the altar to take away my sin. And so I'm going to have to, he would have to be sacrificed. So the difference is God wanted Israel to take Jesus and sacrifice him in belief, believing God that he is their Messiah and he's going to take away their sin of the world. And if they, that's what God wanted them to do. But, if, but what they did instead was they said, we don't want this man to rule over us. He's not our king. We have no king but Caesar. Uh, we're going to follow what Caesar tells us. We're going to follow what the religious leaders tell us. And we're going to get rid of this man. So they didn't, they didn't kill him on a cross believing God. They killed him to try to get rid of him. So that's the difference. God says without faith it is impossible to please God. So God would have been pleased with them accepting him as a sacrifice to take away the sin of the world. But instead, they were in unbelief and by wicked hands took him and crucified him and were subject to God's judgment as a result. Eric, um, Miss Sandy said, I see the truth in it based on scripture, but this is the first time I've been, been so keenly made aware of it. And then she said, wonderful teaching. Thank you, Eric. Uh, you're welcome. Let me give you one more verse. Psalm 118. Just so you know, I'm not just making this up out of thin air. Um, Psalm 118. Verse 26, Psalm 118, 26 says, Blessed be he that cometh in the name of the Lord. We have blessed you out of the house of the Lord. Now, if you know... Um, Hold your place there and look at um, Matthew 21. That, that Psalm 118, 26 is actually fulfilled in what's called the triumphal entry of Jesus coming into Jerusalem on the foal of an ass. He rides into the, into the city and they put palm branches out in front of him in verse 8, Matthew 21, 8. And a very great multitude spread their garments in the way. Others cut down branches from the trees and strawed them in the way. And the multitudes that went before and that followed cried, saying, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. So that is a fulfillment of Psalm 118, 26. And Psalm, so go back to Psalm 118. And in verse 26, Blessed be he that cometh in the name of the Lord. We have blessed you out of the house of the Lord. So in other words, if they did what God told them to do, they would have said, Our Messiah is coming to Jerusalem, to the temple, to be our sacrifice. So let's go out of the temple, go meet him. Say, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And let's lead him into the temple to, for the sacrifice. Verse 27, Psalm 118, 27 God is the Lord, which has showed us light. Jesus Christ is the light. Bind the sacrifice with cords, even unto the horns of the altar. <coughs> Excuse me. So they're saying, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Let's bring him into the temple. Bind him as the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Bind him with cords, even unto the horns of the altar. Thou art my God, and I will praise thee. Thou art my God, I will exalt thee. That's why, by the way, when you're in, if you, if you go back to Matthew 21, when it says in verse 9, you know, verse 8, they cut down the palm branches. Verse 9, they say, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Verse 10, when he was coming to Jerusalem, all the city was moved and saying, Who is this? All right, there shows they're an apostasy. They should have known this is their Messiah. And the multitude said, this is Jesus, the prophet of Nazareth of Galilee. Wrong answer. 
They should have said, this is Jesus, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. That's what John the Baptist said. But they said, he's just a prophet. But Jesus knew why he was there. So what does he do? Verse 12, And Jesus went into the temple of God and cast out all them that sold and bought in the temple and overthrew the tables of the money changers and the seats of them that sold doves. Basically, he says, I have come to be the sacrifice. They fulfilled the first part, laying down palm branches, blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Now I'm going to the temple to be sacrificed, but now you've got all these money changers here. So i got to get rid of them. That's why he does it there. That's why the first thing he does when he comes into Jerusalem is he goes to the temple and gets rid of the money changers. And he's there, really, for them to sacrifice him. And instead, verse 23, when he was coming to the temple, the chief priest and the elders of the people came unto him as he was teaching and said, By what authority doest thou these things? And who gave thee this authority? He just gets opposition when he's in the temple. Instead of them saying, Here is the Lamb of God which taketh the sin of the world. Let's bind the sacrifice on the altar. They say, Who is this? Who's giving you the authority to do this? They're in unbelief. And that's why he ends up concluding, as we read before, in Matthew 23 and verse 38, Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. I have come in here to be the sacrifice for your sins. I've cleansed the temple to get these money changers out of the way. Let's do the sacrifice. And instead, they just question his authority. They try to trip him up with questions. And so then he spends all of Matthew 23 giving them an indictment and say, ye serpents, ye generation of vipers, how can ye escape the damnation of hell? And then he says, that's it, I'm out of here. That's why he says, your house is left unto you desolate, and I say unto you, you shall not see me henceforth, till ye shall say, blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. That's going to be a second coming. So they had their chance and they blew it. Lenny said, wow, Eric. Wow. Um, <laughs> that was great. That was great. <laughs> Thank you, Eric. Uh, yes, yeah, Scott, I see your comment there. Um, yeah, well, I'll upload these to YouTube, and I'll send out the link to the YouTube videos. I didn't read all the little comments, I don't think. Maybe I did. Well, one way in a fall branch for the same one as the other people probably we would have no we don't have no change of season. I couldn't hear Lenny, he was breaking up. What did he say? Oh, I'm, I'm sorry, Eric, can you come over here? Eric, uh, you know, I was saying the same, you know, most of the same, not all, but most of the same folks laying down the palm branches and, and uh, admiring Christ as he came in were probably the same ones uh, a couple of days later saying crucified, we will have no king. Probably a bunch of the same folks. Yeah, you're probably right. You, you, you know, you look at, you look at today, you can, people are just so easily swayed. They'll do whatever their, what their authority is, whatever the religious leaders tell them to do, so... Yeah, they're thinking, oh, this is what we're supposed to do, lay down the palm branches. And then they see the religious leaders saying, crucify him. So they say, okay, let's crucify him. Yeah, they're probably the same people. Yeah. Thank you, Eric, for what you did tonight. It was some really good stuff. And a few things I still got to wrap my brain around. But thank you, I need that. Yeah, it's a lot of material to cover, yeah. All right, well, thanks, everybody. I guess we'll close for the night and... Uh, See you next week then.